Hey guys, I wanted to touch base about the ethics of living Jim Crow, our new text for this week. Since I'm having you guys annotate your text, I wanted to show you what my paper looked like. Sorry about the yellow lines on the screen. This is a janky system of me trying to actually show you my picture of my paper text. Um, but let's look at this first part. So one of the things that we're looking at in this text is diction, which is word choice. So in this first part, I want to point out all of the words that refer to army-like or war-like war stuff. So we've got these fine weapons, this hot war, gritty ammunition, this target. This is all of the things that they're using to describe how these boys are fighting with each other and play fighting, right? Um, I also want to point out the imagery of this white versus black, okay? So their house is behind the railroad tracks. It's a skimpy yard was paved with black cinders. Cinders meaning like ashy type stuff. Nothing green ever grew in that yard. The only touch of green we could see was far away beyond the tracks over where the white folks lived. That's important because they keep on bringing up green related to the white folks versus the ash of their environment. Then stuff gets a little bit more interesting in the second paragraph when we continue this fight in this army-like diction, but it's with white boys and the black boys. So we have this cinder environment um, and they are engaged in this war with the white boys. I'm gonna go ahead and underline that. That's what's going on, who live beyond the tracks. So they have their cinder barrage, barrage being more of an army type diction terms to wipe the white boys out. But then they replied with a steady bombardment of broken bottles. Okay, so we've got their two ammunitions, right? Basically the cinder versus the broken bottles. Cinder is not going to cause as much pain as broken bottles. So you need to take that into account that, you know, as far as the lethal manner of the weapons, so the broken bottle is better weaponry than the cinder. Also note the alliteration I circled. So the bees in bombardment of broken bottles, all of that, those bees at the beginning of those words is alliteration. Okay, we've got the trees, hedges, and sloping embankments of their lawn. Once again, kind of talking about the environments they're in. So this versus the brick pillars, okay? Um, you can see at the top, I've got like, it's white versus black. It's the green versus cinder. It's the, uh, the hedges versus the brick pillars. We've got this kind of... Um, set up how they're kind of comparing everything that the black neighborhood has versus the white. Okay, um, more diction. We've got demoralized our ranks. Sounds like they're talking about an army. Also, my fellow combatants, um, definitely army type stuff. Just in general with this text, I wanna point some things out at the bottom. So you can see that I've highlighted the, how come you didn't hide? How come you always fight? That's an important line because this kid expects his mom to be caring and nurturing after he comes home with these stitches, but she's not, she beats him um, because it is really dangerous for him to fight with the white boys. And so she beats him to impart to me with gems of Jim Crow wisdom. That's probably important seeing that this title of this text is The Ethics of Living Jim Crow. Um, the most important thing that he's taking away from this situation was that he was never, never under any conditions to fight the white folks again, okay? Um, and at the end here, I know it's a little bit hard with those, the yellow, um, she finished by telling me that I ought to be thankful to God as long as I live that they didn't kill me because sometimes that happens in this time period. This is the time period of lynchings and really bad racial violence. And so these things are not unfounded. Let's continue to the next part of section one. Um, so once again, we've got more of this comparison of the green versus um, the black. So we've got um, the repetition of black in this one to really point out this new neighborhood that they moved to being this black belt where it's so solidly black. 
Here's the thing that this is actually true. There were housing laws that didn't allow black people to buy houses in white neighborhoods. So this was legitimate as far as like there were just straight up black neighborhoods because that's where they were allowed to live. Um, you also know the the repetition of the trees, the hedges, the lawns. We got trees, hedges, lawns. And then he he comes in and says it again down here, trees, hedges and lawns when he's talking about going his to his first job to talk about this um, this white environment. And he he knows what he has to do in order to get the job. So he has to stand up straight and neat, say, say sharp yes sirs and no sirs, pronounce his sirs distinctly. And he needs to be polite and he needs to know his place where he was and that he was a white man and he had more control over him. These are those unwritten um, Jim Crow laws that he's following. This is that racial etiquette, okay? Meanwhile, the white man is allowed to treat him as if he's a dog, dehumanizing him, examining him like a prize poodle. It's pretty messed up. Okay, if you look down at the dialogue, I wanna point something out before I log off. So first off, the white people, note, note how the white people are always calling him boy. That is a very common racial um, slur back then, just in general, to call grown men boys. And also note how he's always saying like, yes, sir, I'd like it fine, sir. It always has to be the sirs. Even the 17 year old kid who's about his same age since this is his first job, he's even calling him boy. So. It's just the general like time period disrespect. Let me know if you have any questions on this text. Thanks guys.